Washingtonian Magazine once referred to Jeremy Gifford, the founder of Walters, as someone who knows how to pack a bar. Walters is located across the street from Nationals Park near the Centerfield Gate next to South Capitol Street. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Now he fires. And Stevenson launches one left center field. Way back it goes. Wood giving chase. He can only look up as it is long gone. Home run for Stevenson makes it 4-2 Cincinnati. Cruz coming set. Staring down the runner at second. The pitch home. Swing a line drive right field. It's slicing down. It is fair. Young rounding third. He will score. The ball bobbled along the wall by Hines as Thomas scoots into second with a game-tying RBI double. Infield dropping back with two out. Here's the pitch. Swing and a line drive, base hit, past the diving third baseman Espinal. In to score from third is Vargas. And Jacob Young has delivered a two-out go-ahead RBI single here in the bottom of the eighth inning. It's now the Nationals five and the Reds four here with two out of the bottom of the eighth inning. And welcome to Nats Chat for Sunday, July 21st, 2024. Along with MassInSports.com Nationals insider Mark Zuckerman, who was at Nationals Park, I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. The Nats, for a second consecutive Saturday, overcame an ultra-short outing from their starting pitcher to win in come-from-behind fashion against a National League Central team. I'm not sure what all of this is about, but this has become a thing. Two Saturdays ago, July 13th, a 6-5 win at the NL Central leading Milwaukee Brewers in a game in which the Nats overcame a 5-0 fourth inning deficit. The Nats won that game despite Mitchell Parker officially allowing five runs in two-thirds of an inning. And now, this most recent Saturday, July 20th, a 5-4 win over the Cincinnati Reds at Nationals Park in a game in which the Nats overcame a 4-2 fourth inning deficit. The Nats won this game despite Mackenzie Gore allowing three runs in two innings. So the Nats have won each of the first two games of this three-game series against the Reds. The Nats now have won four of their last five games. The Nats for this regular season now are 46 and 53. We this season on the Nats Chat Podcast are offering shout-outs. If you would like to send a shout-out to someone who you care about, email Tim Shovers at NatsChatPodcast at gmail.com. Coming up later in the show, the truth about what is going on with Nats starting pitcher Cade Cavalli. But Mark, tremendous work by the Nats bullpen on Saturday evening. Some clutch hitting by the Nats offense on Saturday evening. And for a second consecutive Saturday, an unlikely but impressive win. You know, Al, for a lot of the first few months, we thought we had figured out what the Nationals formula was to win a game. And it was pretty simple. It was get good starting pitching get just enough hitting, and then ride a very good bullpen to win a close, low-scoring, tight ball game. I think we found the new formula to win. It's get your starter knocked out before the third inning, ask your bullpen to go seven-plus and maybe give up one run at most, and then chip away at an early deficit and somehow come away with the win. I don't know that anybody would ever put together that as a preferred formula for winning baseball games, but somehow this team has done it now twice in their last four games. It's been a week, but remember the all-star break. So that's twice in their last four games. They've overcome a start like that where they didn't even reach the third inning where your starter pitch count in the first inning was well into the 40s. I've never seen anything like it. All the credit to them. 
for not giving in at that point and gutting it out and getting a ton of performances from a lot of different guys to make these wins possible. It was an odd deal because the crowd at Nationals Park on Saturday evening got loud. And in watching the game, it felt like the comeback was more monumental than it actually was. 4-2 in the fourth inning. That, that's not that sizable of a deficit, but it felt like so much more. When your starting pitcher lasts for just two innings like Mackenzie Gore did, that feels almost insurmountable. That's almost like, okay, they're not going to win this game. Like, come on. But they did. They found a way to get the job done. And I think you have to salute this bullpen, which for a second straight Saturday does yeoman's work. I mean, this was something. Remember, the Nats in the win on Friday evening ended up using five relievers because of what happened in the top of the ninth inning. The Nats allowing four runs in that top of the ninth inning. Five more Nats relievers got utilized on Saturday evening, but these guys came through. Jordan Weems, Robert Garcia, Dylan Floro, Derek Law, and Kyle Finnegan combining to allow one run in seven innings. The one run came off Weems. He, in the top of the third, gave up a one-out solo homer by Tyler Stevenson on a bomb to left center field for a 4-2 Reds lead. That homer went a projected 426 feet per stat cast, and it was at that point that you said to yourself, all right, this is probably going to be game to which the Nats give up, what, seven, eight, nine runs, something like that. No. Robert Garcia, a perfect top of the fourth. Dylan Floro, two scoreless innings. Derek Law, two scoreless innings with two swinging strikeouts. And then Kyle Finnegan, who shouldn't have had to pitch on Friday night, but did. He was back out there on Saturday evening, a perfect top of the ninth for the save. You can't keep doing this. Five relievers being used game in, game out. But man, what a job by the Nats bullpen. There does seem to be a cumulative effect of this. When one guy puts up a zero or multiple zeros, it's almost like they all get into the spirit of it and feel like, well, I got to be the next one. I can't you know, blow this now, given what kind of effort we're getting. And, and Derek Law spoke about this after the game to us, that it's sort of a community effort when you get into that kind of situation as a bullpen. You realize what's going to go on. You realize how much is going to be asked of everyone. And you just want to do your part. No one individual is going to win that game themselves. It's going to require a bunch of you doing it. And you just kind of pass the baton onto the next one. He called it a locker room win, the kind of win that brings a team close together. And he said, you hate to say this, but you kind of need a few of those every season. It did mean more. Like you said, the crowd felt it. This is a game that in the third inning, you're not thinking they should win. And they still find a way to win. That does bring a team closer together. Now, you know whether it matters on Sunday or next week or next month, who knows? But they have shown a penchant for doing this now. And I think within the clubhouse, it just kind of grows. And they feel like when they're in this spot again, hopefully they're not. But if they are in that spot again, it's like, hey, been there, done that. We can take care of this. The Nats bullpen, we've talked about this. There certainly have been games in which the bullpen has struggled, especially lately. But it feels like this season, more than any other season in which we've been doing this podcast, there have been these standout performances, these games where you say to yourself, man, the bullpen was so good and so key to this Nats win. We saw that last Saturday. We see that in this victory on Saturday evening. And then when it came to the Nats offense in this game, so the Nats uh, are able to put together five runs. The five runs come on nine hits. And to go with a walk, four for 13 with runners in scoring position. The uh, nine hits comprised of a homer, two doubles, and six singles. Three offensive performances stand out in particular. So off the two home runs from the Nats on Friday evening, we got another big homer on Saturday evening. Harold Ramirez, he is the Nats starting DH and number four batter. One for three with a two-run homer and a hit by pitch. He did strike out twice, but Ramirez in a Nats two-run first, a two-out two-run homer on a bomb to center field to tie the game at two. That homer going a projected 429 feet per stat cast. Mackenzie Gore gave up two runs in the top of the first, but the Nats answered right back with that Ramirez two-run homer in the bottom of the first. Lane Thomas, he had a big hit in this game. Thomas on Saturday evening as the Nats starting right fielder and number two batter, one for four with an RBI double, and he had a stolen base. Uh, the RBI double coming in a one-run seventh for the Nats, a game-tying one-out full count opposite field RBI double to shallow right field to tie the game at four despite Thomas having been down at 1.02, and he had a steal of third base. And then Jacob Young, who was very good on Friday evening, was again good 
in this game on Saturday evening. Your Nats starting center fielder and number nine batter, two for three with an RBI single, another single, and a hit by pitch. And he went two for two on stolen bases. The Nats over the first two games of this series are running all over the Reds. Jacob Young in particular, four for four on stolen bases over the first two games. But Jacob Young in the Nats, one run eighth, a tie-breaking, two out, First pitch RBI single into left field for a 5-4 Nats lead, and he then stole second base. Also young in the Nats, one run seventh, a leadoff single through the left side of the infield, and he had to steal a second base in that inning. And young in the Nats, one run fourth, a two-out hit by pitch. So not necessarily, you know, the guys you immediately think of when you think Nats offense, but Ramirez, Thomas, Young, all coming through in different ways in this game. They need this from more guys. They can't count on the same two or three to produce for you. And we talked about Friday night, how they got the power from their first baseman for the first time in a while, from their catcher, which they've needed. And here it is from your DH. You need this. And I'm sure there were people, myself included, that saw the lineup come out and say, boy, you're really going to start Harold Ramirez over Jesse Winker, who's been so good for them. And I know you're facing a lefty, but boy, doesn't Winker give you good quality at bats no matter what? And you're going to put him in such a prominent spot, clean up. And then what's he do? He hits a two-run homer in the first inning and sets the tone for them offensively. So I credit Davey Martinez. He's really trying to put all of his guys in the best possible position to have success. And it doesn't always work, but I think he's been consistent with this. And it makes the players themselves feel confident that they know the manager believes in them. If you don't start a guy, a right-handed platoon player, essentially, against a lefty, he's thinking, well, then why am I even here if I'm not going to be in this game? So if that gave a little boost of confidence to Harold Ramirez, and then he delivered, and now he knows next time he's going to be counted on again to come through like that. I do think that goes a long way. So I'd like to see that. That was good. Lane Thomas with the hit off a righty. We've talked about the struggles he's had against right-handers. So that was a good bat. It was a seven pitch at bat that he capped off. So it wasn't just like a little fluke first pitch or anything. And then Jacob Young in the eighth, You know, I was thinking to myself, man on third, two out, infield playing back. We know what Jacob Young's offensive mindset is very often. I would not have been surprised at all if he squared around to bunt there. And I'm not saying that would have been the right call, but I would not have been surprised by it if he tried it. Instead, he said, no, I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to look for a pitch up in the zone and in, as he said, on the first pitch. He got a cutter up and in, and he turned on it and he ripped it to left field for the RBI single and the eventual go-ahead run. So, Good for him, I think, to realize that he can produce for them with conventional swings. It doesn't have to be small ball all the time. He went up there with a plan, was looking for something specific, got it, went right after it, and had a really nice hit in a big moment to give them the win. And along the lines of the uh, Ramirez-Winker scenario that you just laid out, so Ildemaro Vargas was the Nats' starting second baseman for this game, not Luis Garcia Jr., and Vargas did produce. So he is the Nats' starting second baseman and number six batter, two for four with a double and a single, each hit coming in a run-scoring inning for the Nats. Uh, Vargas in the Nats' one run fourth, a single through the left side of the infield. Vargas in the Nats' one run eighth, a leadoff double off the left field wall. Look, I don't have that much of an appetite to see Vargas playing over Garcia, but you got to give credit where credit's due. Vargas in this game was an offensive factor, to be sure. So good stuff from him. Hey, Nat Shet, want to tell you about Mint Mobile's premium wireless package starting at $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer in your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash natschat. That's mintmobile.com slash natschat. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash natschat. $45 upfront payment required. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigs on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. 
Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. A gorgeous night for baseball here in Syracuse. 2-2. Swinging a fly ball deep in the air left field. And Rochester has gotten right back in this one. Brady House with a three-run home run. Here's a report from Rochester's 8-5 loss on Saturday. Brady House, as you just heard, went deep his first home run in AAA. Leading off and playing center field was Dylan Cruz. RBI single also drew two walks. His OPS is at 722. And getting the start, by the way, was Jackson Rutledge. His outing only lasted three and a third innings, allowed eight earned runs, and issued four walks. Now back to the show. The 3 2 pitch, swinging a slow ground ball right side, fielded by the first baseman Candelario, race to the bag, and safe is the call. A run scores. Lodolo a little late to get there. Abrams hustles down the line for an infield hit. It's now the Reds for the Nationals three. I want to mention C.J. Abrams. So he had two infield hits in this game, but one of them really was impressive. Abrams in this game as the Nats starting shortstop and leadoff man, two for five, RBI infield single and another infield single. And he had a stolen base, but Abrams in the Nats one run fourth, a two out full count RBI infield single to the right side of the infield to cut the Nats deficit to four three. Abrams in that count was down at one point, one, two, worked the count full, and then got the infield single. And Abrams on the play, like you talk about hustle. This was such impressive hustle. And he ended up beating the red starting pitcher, Nick Lodolo, to the first base back. We know about the speed of C.J. Abrams, but what a job by him. Down one, two, works the count full, hits a grounder to the first base side, which rarely will result in an infield single. And yet because of his great speed, he's able to leg out an infield single and RBI infield single, no less. Davey Martinez went out of his way to compliment that play, not even being asked about it. He brought it up himself and he said, that was awesome. If we could play with that intensity every day, I mean, good things are going to happen. You can tell that meant something to him that resonated within the dugout. They were talking about in the clubhouse afterward and in a game in which they had a lot of other big things that happened, they felt like that display of hustle by C.J. Abrams set the tone for everyone else and was something that everybody could take something from. It's, you know, the fourth inning of a game that's already kind of dragging. You don't know how this is going to play out. It's two outs in the inning. You hit a little tapper. You know what? Bust it down the line. You never know what might happen. The pitcher was just a tick late to cover. And because of that, he beat it out and they scored a critical run. So that was a really important little thing. And we keep talking about little things and when they're not doing them so well, that was a little thing they did exceptionally well. And the kind of thing that anybody can do, you just have to apply the effort in the moment. And he did that. Juan Yepes did have another hit. He is the Nats starting first baseman and number three batter, one for four with a single, did strike out twice. We did have James Wood drop down in the Nats lineup. He was the Nats number seven batter in this game, starting left fielder. 0 for 4 with a strikeout, and he committed a fielding error. And, you know, we haven't talked about him much, but uh, Trey Lipscomb is, again, not producing offensively. Lipscomb is essentially playing every game now as an at starting third baseman, which is good. That's what should be the case here. But uh, Lipscomb on Saturday evening as an at's number eight batter, 0 for 4 with two strikeouts. His on base percentage at the major league level for this regular season now at 283, slugging percentage at 257. The defense has has been good, but you got to give us something <laughs> from a batting perspective. And he's just not doing that. He had a good game in Milwaukee last weekend where he drove a double off the wall and you thought, okay, maybe there's a sign of something. But unfortunately, that did not have any carryover effect. He's not hitting the ball hard. He's hitting it on the ground. And very often, he's not making contact at all. A lot of strikeouts. He's certainly not drawing walks as evidenced by that on-base percentage. And 
if not for Jacob Young's clutch hit, we may be talking about how Lipscomb in particular could not get a runner home from third with one out. The infield is being played in. It's a tie game in the bottom of the eighth. Runner on third, go ahead, run. You literally just have to get the ball in the air out of the infield, and he could not do that. He hit a tapper back to the mound. Runner could not score. They're going to stick with him for a little while. Obviously, they want to find out what can he do at this level. To this point, offensively, there has not been a whole lot to get excited about there. And by the way, Brady House hit his first AAA home run. Uh, off a big leaguer, Kodai Senga of the Mets, who's on a rehab assignment. So we know House eventually is going to be here, whether it's later this year or sometime next year. The clock is ticking for Lipscomb to show that he deserves to be the guy. He gets the opportunity first, but that's not unlimited, and he's not just guaranteed to hold that job in the long term if he doesn't show he can hit at the big league level. Yeah, I mentioned the Nats in this game being 4 for 13 with runners in scoring position. We had Lipscomb going 0 for 2. We also had James Wood going 0 for 2. Well, there was a glaring negative from this great Nationals win over the Reds on Saturday evening, and that negative was Mackenzie Gore. He is in a real rut right now. Gore in this game was bad for a third consecutive start and for a fourth time over his last five starts. Uh, This is officially a slump that uh, Mackenzie Gore is in the midst of, and he lasted for just two innings. He, over the two innings, allowed three runs. He gave up just two hits, which were a double and a single, but he issued four walks into wild pitch. He recorded two strikeouts, and he threw a ton of pitches and a ton of balls. Gore over his mere two innings, 67 pitches, 37 strikes versus 30 balls. And if you watch this game in real time, you knew from the get-go this was going to be one of those games for Mackenzie Gore. He and the Reds two run first through an astronomical 48 pitches, 48 pitches in one inning. And then Gore and the Reds one run second through 19 pitches. Mackenzie Gore now over his last three starts has allowed 12 runs in 10 innings. He over those 10 innings has issued 10 walks and specific to the pitches. And I've talked about this. Mackenzie Gore for weeks now has been dead last among all qualified pitchers in the majors for this regular season in pitches per inning. That number now is at 18.77. It may sound like his Pitch efficiency was appreciably better in that second inning with him throwing 19 pitches. Understand, that still is higher than his league-worst average of pitches per inning for this regular season. Again, 18.77. The lack of pitch efficiency, you can't even say like it's a big problem. It's beyond that at this point. He's issuing way too many walks. He's seeing so many of his pitches get fouled off. I thought it was interesting. He, in his post-game session with you guys, said, We know what the problem is. Uh, what is the problem? Because this is concerning what's happening with Mackenzie Gore. The problem seems to be a mechanics thing. It is his front shoulder flying open, leaving his left arm out, and that leads to a lot of those fastballs going to the glove side, tailing away from, say, a right-handed hitter. Now, whether he can actually correct that, it remains to be seen. The concerning thing to me, well, a couple things. Number one, the velocity was down a little bit, about one mile an hour on all of his pitches. So that was concerning. The other problem to me was the first few batters that he can't find the plate at all and, you know, walks the first two, goes nine pitches to the next batter before he finally strikes him out. The pitch count is growing and growing, but then the foul balls start. So he was actually finding the plate eventually as that inning played out, but he could not miss bats or at least get them to hit it into fair territory. They swung at 14 fastballs in the first inning, they fouled off 11 of them. That is astounding to me. So it's not like they see the fastball and they're crushing it, but they are getting to it at least to extend the at-bat. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know if that's mechanics because, again, these are pitches that for the most part were over the plate at that point. They just aren't either located well enough or have enough on them to induce swings and misses or weak contact that actually goes into the field of play. That, to me, was very concerning. And Davey admitted it. I mean, the last batter he faces, it was an eight-pitch strikeout. He starts that batter at 40, which is already ridiculously high total, ends it at 48. That was his last batter no matter what. If he doesn't get him, 
he's not going to be allowed to continue in that inning. And now for the second time in your week, you have them pulling their starter before he even gets out of the first inning. The numbers are just staggering to throw that many pitches to only seven hitters. There were no quick at bats. Every single one was dragged out. And it was a combination of, you know, missing way off the plate, but even when he was over the plate, they were at least making contact and fouling it off and just prolonging it even more. Mackenzie Gore, you think about him, he's a lefty, he's pitch inefficient, he can issue a ton of walks, but he also can be quite good when he is good. Is he the new Gio Gonzalez? Do you see a parallel there? Do you see a comp there? Now, look, in fairness to Gio, Gio had some very good regular seasons. Gore has not done that yet. So, you know, Gore actually has a ways to go before he's actually Gio. But in terms of what a guy is at his best, but also is at his worst, is that a viable comp in your opinion or not so much? There are certainly similarities there. I'll say that. And I think the thing, the one thing I'll say, Mackenzie Gore has better stuff than Gio Gonzalez ever did. Now, that doesn't guarantee anything. You can have the best stuff in the world, but if you can't locate it, who cares? It doesn't mean anything. But the similarity is, as you said, that tendency to just let innings really go on, to drive you crazy with pitch inefficiency, and yet still to somehow find a way to minimize the damage at times. Now, I would say the hope would be, and I think the Nationals hope this as well, is that Mackenzie Gore ultimately is going to be better than Gio Gonzalez ever was, meaning he can be a true number one, number two starter. But I will say this. I think we say the name Gio Gonzalez and we sometimes associate negative things with that. I'm going to read you Gio Gonzalez's stats with the Nationals over the course of uh, seven seasons with them. 86 and 65 record, 362 ERA, 213 starts that he made, a 1.283 whip. So... Was he an ace for them? No. One year, 2012, he won 21 games, Cy Young finalist, pitched like an ace that year. Other than that, no. He was a number two at best, maybe more like number three. But he also was consistently one of the better left-handers in the league for a long time who stayed very healthy and had a very good career. Not great, but good. Now, again, the hope would be that Mackenzie Gore has a great career. The ceiling seems to be higher for him. But at the moment, he does kind of pitch the way that Gio Gonzalez did. And if that's who he ends up being in the long run, not to say that's a best case scenario, because it's not, but it's also not a worst case scenario. They would be okay with Mackenzie Gore doing for them what Gio Gonzalez did for seven years. Yeah. And like I said, Gio, and you just said this too, Gio had success. Gore has not done that yet. So like, Everything with Gore is theoretical. He could be this. He might be that. He hasn't done these things, though, yet. We're still in the process of figuring out what he is. And uh, he got off to a very good start this season, but uh, he is in a rut right now. So this is going to be key, how he uh, goes here in these coming weeks. But uh, not good. I give him credit. Like, when he talks to you guys, he owns it. He doesn't shy away from it. He doesn't make excuses. We know that he can be hard on himself. So, you know, you get the feeling like he takes this seriously. You know, they're going to attack this head on and, and try to get their arms around this, but they do need to get their arms around this. If Josiah Gray is about to undergo Tommy John surgery and miss a good chunk of next season, now more than ever, you need Gore to be who he was acquired to be. And he obviously is not there yet. And, you know, there's irony, right? Because if I would have told you going into this season, Gore and Gray, one of them is going to miss the, a good chunk of this upcoming season due to an elbow injury, is going to undergo UCL surgery. Wouldn't you have said Mackenzie Gore, right? When they got him, he was injured. Josiah Gray had never been on a major league injured list. And now here we are. It's Gray who's out for the foreseeable future. And Gore, I'll say this, he's been durable for the Nats. Like, they've done a good job of keeping him healthy. He has stayed healthy, but uh, not pitching at his best right now. This summer, Nats Chat Podcast had the pleasure of receiving a bunch of Omaha steaks in the mail. Meat is so expensive at restaurants these days. If you're like me and you crave steak for dinner on the right occasion, ordering from Omaha Steaks is the way to go. The first meat I fired up was filet mignon, always been my favorite since I was a kid, and the Omaha Steaks version was no different. Shop the Hotter Than Fire sale today and get exclusive savings on packages to begin at $99. Plus, get an extra 10 bucks off with the promo code NATSCHAT at checkout. Every steak and every entree is vacuum sealed and ready when you want to grill. 
Omaha Steaks is so confident in their meat that it's a 100% money-back guarantee situation. So for the final stretch of grilling season, make sure to check out Omaha Steaks' Hotter Than Fire sale. Get exclusive savings on packages that start at just $99. Plus, get an extra $10 off with promo code NATSCHAT at checkout. Hi, Nats fans. This is Tim Newmark, D.C. area composer, longtime Nationals fan, and proud composer of the Nats Chat podcast theme song. If you're enjoying the music and would like to hear more, check out timnewmark.com slash streaming, or just search for Tim Newmark wherever you listen to music. To find the rest of the song you're hearing now, search for the title Double in the Sun. Go Nats! Tim Shovers here to tell you about Game Time. This summer at Jiffy Lube Live, acts include Neil Young, Hank Williams Jr., and Chris Stapleton. If you're interested in finding tickets to any of these shows, make sure to check out the Game Time app. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. We just wanted to keep him down and really honestly slow him down a little bit. You know, he said he, you know, he had that dead arm for a little while. Uh, and him being sick, you know, we just didn't want to push him. We're going to get him back back on the mound. I think, you know, next step is send him back to Florida and get him going again. Well, speaking of a young Nat starting pitcher on whom there are high hopes, uh, but who has yet to uh, deliver on those hopes, Cade Cavalli. We've been talking about what is going on with Cade Cavalli. He underwent his Tommy John surgery in March 2023. He still is not back pitching at the major league level, and his uh, rehab process has been paused for a second time. I know that you went into the day of Saturday with the intent of finding out the truth about what is happening with Cade Cavalli, and uh, you got some answers. We did. It's not great answers, although it's not necessarily, you know, worst case kind of scenario, but it did feel like something more had to be going on here. So for those who've lost track, and, you know, I don't blame you if that's been the case because it's been hard to keep up with what exactly is going on here. He last made a rehab start on June 21st at high A. It was a good start, three innings, and you thought, okay, he's on the right track here. He may not be that far away from returning. The initial thought all along that he had espoused for a while was that he wanted to be back off the IL pitching in the big leagues sometime in June, if not then, at least in July. So he makes that start in June, and then he ends up, and I'm not 100% sure of the timing here, which happened first and which happened second. But within the course of that next like week to 10 days, he both got sick. He had the flu and really was like down for the count a little while with that. And when he tried to throw, and it may have been prior to getting sick or it may have been shortly after that as he started to ramp up again, had what pitchers call dead arm. Now, that sounds bad, but it's not uncommon. A lot of guys in spring training will have this sometime in March. It's usually as you start to build your arm back up, you're making starts every five days, you just have a day where it just doesn't feel the same. And it just feels like there isn't any life in your arm and the velocity goes down. You're not hurt, but your arm just doesn't feel ready for this, whatever it is. They usually give you a couple days off, maybe skip a start, something like that. You come back and for the most part, guys are fine. They start the season and everything's good. So the timing of this is a little weird that this would happen to him at this stage of his recovery and his rehab program, but it did happen. And once that happened, combined with feeling sick, they said, let's not take any chances here. Let's kind of shut you down. And once you're feeling fully better, we start you up again. Now that process is taking a while. He's here with the team right now. He's going to go to Florida once the Nats go back on the road at the end of the week and start the process up. And we know they're not just going to throw him into a game. They're going to make him build this all up again. And so it's going to be a while. And so what was supposed to be June or July 
I don't see a scenario right now where he's pitching in the big leagues prior to September 1st. Maybe the very end of August, best case scenario, but probably not until September. And now you're talking maybe five or six starts that he makes for you before the end of the year. And, you know, yeah, they've done fine that their rotation depth has been good enough that it's not a, a killer for them. But as we've talked about, you get to the end of the season, to me, you have to know what Cade Cavalli is. You don't know that yet. He's made one big league start. He's going to end up spending the majority of two seasons on the IL coming back from a major elbow surgery. If he really is a big part of your 2025 rotation, you need to have some evidence to know what he's going to be. It's all theoretical with him for now. You talked about Gore. There's a way bigger body of work on Gore to evaluate than there is on Cavalli. He may be an ace, but he may not be. We just don't know. And it's going to be a while longer until we even have the chance to see and start to make those kind of judgments. Yeah, really disheartening. And you're not going to know what he is exiting this season. And you're going to go into next season still not knowing. You've lost two seasons of service time with him these last two years in this prolonged recovery from Tommy John surgery. It's rough. And, you know, not to pile on with the bad starting pitching news, but also on Saturday was Jackson Rutledge getting shellacked at AAA for Rochester. Eight runs in three and a third innings. Your Jackson Rutledge ERA for Rochester this season now at 732. So, you know, it's an odd deal. Jake Irvin, Mitchell Parker, DJ Hers, great. But Mackenzie Gore, Josiah Gray, Cade Cavalli, Jackson Rutledge, not so great. There's sort of a lot to digest this season when it comes to young Nats starting pitchers. And I don't blame any Nats fan who, who feels a little conflicted. Like, should you be encouraged or more discouraged by what's happening with young Nats starting pitchers this season? There just is a lot to take in. And I think that's part of you know our conversation going back to the last episode of this offseason, the Nats potentially aggressively pursuing a big name free agent starting pitcher. I think that's part of why, because there's just there is a lot of uncertainty here. There are some good things happening, but there are some not so good things happening with Nats starting pitching. I think the most encouraging thing of it is that there are enough of them that you say, okay, we don't need everybody to pan out. If I had told you at the start of the season what was going to happen with Cavalli and Gray in particular, you would have thought, oh, this team's going to be in bad shape because they need those two. Now, as it turns out, they haven't, and they've been able to offset those injuries and those issues. Now, long run, we still don't know if any of the others are going to turn into what they're supposed to, but at least in my mind, there are enough of them that you say if three or ideally four of them do turn out to be decent, then you're okay and it's not the end of the world if somebody that you were counting on at the start of this process, if they don't turn into what you want them to be, you're okay with it. So it's frustrating. It's not the way you wanted this to go, but there's at least enough of them that I think it does give you the leeway to not have to put everything on the shoulders of whatever few quality young pitchers you may have. And especially if the Nats are developing a propensity for taking non-first round pitchers, non-highly hyped pitchers, and getting those guys to be good major league starting pitchers, then it doesn't have to be that you have to hit on all of your you know, highly regarded pitching prospects. So yeah, there is that for sure. Now, speaking of one of these guys who was not necessarily supposed to be a great starting pitcher for the Nats, but who has had an overall good season. So Jake Irvin will be the Nats starting pitcher for Sunday's game against the Reds. The Nats can complete a three-game sweep here of the Reds. So, you know, we've been talking about some negative stuff here, but the Nats, of course, great come from behind win on Saturday evening, have won each of the first two games of this series. But I actually feel like this is kind of a big start for Jake Irvin. He has not been good over his last two starts. I wouldn't say that he's in like the same kind of a rut that Mackenzie Gore is in. But Irvin over his last two outings has not been the Jake Irvin we have come to know and love this season. And another bad outing. And then you do start to say that this guy is in a rut. But if he bounces back, you say, okay, maybe he's getting worn down before the All-Star break. All is back to being good again. So I think that uh, Sunday afternoon could be quite telling for Jake Irvin. Yeah, I agree. It feels like this little downturn happened right as all that all-star talk started up. And I'm not saying that affected him at all, but it is interesting that it timed out that way. Hopefully the break was good for him. This is a big second half for Jake Irvin because like so many of these young starters, you think you have an idea of what he might be and maybe the bar has been raised a little bit because of what he did 
through most of the first half, but he's not proven enough yet. That's still a big question mark. You would love for him to show over the next two and a half months that he is the guy we saw in the first half. And if that happens, man, you've got yourself a top line uh, right-handed pitcher who's going to be here for a long time. But things can go south in a hurry. We saw Josiah Gray struggle the second half last year. It would not be unprecedented. So he's still got to prove himself over the long haul. And yeah, I think it is important for him to come out and do that and give some innings because the bullpen, here we are again, is going to be depleted come Sunday. Kyle Finnegan's pitched two days in a row. And we talked about this. If if they had won that game Friday night without having to call on their closer, a game they led eight to one going into the ninth, then there's not a question of this. But all of a sudden, are you pitching Finnegan three in a row coming out of the All-Star break or is he down? And oh, by the way, you don't have your backup closer anymore. Hunter Harvey is a Kansas City Royal. So you need length from Jake Irvin, and you probably need to hope you have a little larger lead than one or two runs because it may have to be somebody unconventional pitching the ninth for you. Finnegan was an all-star, did not pitch in the all-star game, but he has gotten plenty of work uh, so far in this series. And yes, it would be nice if Davey Martinez did not have to use five relievers for a third consecutive game in this series come Sunday afternoon. Hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email us as well, Podcast at gmail.com. We invite you to check out our website, natschatpodcast.com, in which you can purchase a Nats Chat podcast t-shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 106.7 The Fan. Nats Chat is on the radio Sunday morning 9 to 10 on ESPN Richmond, which is 106.1 FM in the Richmond, Virginia area, and Sunday morning 9 to 10 on Priority Sports Radio 94.1 in the Virginia Beach area. For Mark Zuckerman, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast. Here's the set. The pitch on the way. Swung on. Hit in the air to deep left center field. This one is way back. It's going, going, and it is gone. Goodbye! Into the brew house. Red seats. About six rows deep just below the tables. Bang! Zoom goes Harold Ramirez with his first home run in a Nationals uniform. This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.